uh, and, but we are in the practice of um, a translocal partnership with a foundation called the Chorus Foundation. And their spend down uh, foundation um, has made a long-term commitment to several communities across uh, the country, uh, including Kentucky, Richmond, California, and Alaska, uh, as, long, as well as, of course, Buffalo, New York. And so uh, we have the immense privilege and opportunity to be in relationship with these incredible folks who are working on the front lines, just like we are um, in these different areas. And um, I started uh, this grant experiment when I was uh, the Director of Equitable Development at Open Buffalo and have been to all the convenings uh, that have transpired and taken place over the, the number of years. Uh, and the first person who I actually met uh, from the Alaska team related to Ruth is her mother, Heather, who is a juggernaut in the movement um, and just a person who I've just become to appreciate. She's an elder um, and, and has that status. She's, an, she's absolutely an elder. Um, and the other elder, which we know locally, uh, is our now ancestor, Lorna C. Hill. And uh, the two of them really help to hold and guide those spaces um, in different ways. And uh, Heather would often bring up her daughter, Ruth, who was, around, who was at Brown University uh, doing some work. And uh, so we'd, we'd just talk about this person uh, and how much work she was doing in climate justice work. Uh, but I didn't have the privilege of really meeting Ruth until uh, uh, several convenings in. Uh, and then finally we landed and all of us were dying to go to Alaska. And we kept on saying the chorus, like, when are we going to Alaska? <laughs> when are we going to Alaska? Uh, when are we gonna see uh, what is going on with our indigenous brothers, sisters, and siblings? And uh, we waited for the perfect time and the perfect moment. Uh, uh, it, it was sunny all the time when we were there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that the sun ever went down. Um, and it was like a wild, incredible journey. While we were there, we learned an incredible amount of things that quite honestly, I was very ignorant, not only uh, in the context of Alaska, but just in our home place of not knowing that Silo City as we know it was Buffalo Creek and was the reservation. Uh, in the city of Buffalo. And so there's a lot of the local history that it came back really wanting to know and understand. Uh, what I learned there is we did a deep dive into understanding uh, some of the things um, that maybe people think of as, as more common knowledge than, than I knew, uh, but boarding schools and how to detribalize and assimilate uh, indigenous Alaskans uh, and what trauma that incurred. And uh, some of you know, I'm a foster parent now, and uh, there are actually laws now uh, on the books uh, in order to keep indigenous families together. Um, and there's the Indian Childhood uh, Welfare Act that has tried to keep um, tribal governments uh, and the ability to keep uh, families together and, and remain and retain the heritage and culture of indigenous folks. Um, I also remember uh, a moment with Ruth. I sat next to her almost the whole convening there in Alaska, and she was filling me in uh, nonstop uh, and, and truly just teach, yes, truly whispering and teaching me as much as possible. And a moment came in, in the room where we realized that RBG is not the hero that we think she is, right? That she, yeah, exactly, that she has dedicated her life, of course, to gender justice, and she held out so long for so, so many different causes, but one thing that she got wrong, uh, that Ruth, as I <gasps> gasped in uh, utter disbelief, that um, she often took and, and was anti-Indigenous, uh, and we can't have uh, a revisionist history about where people stood. Um, some of her cases, like uh, Schiller versus Oneida, uh, actually is a New York State case um, that she wrote the majority uh, um, uh, opinion about in an eight to one uh, and also the doctrine of discovery which puts uh, Christendom as a supremacist thought and that all indigenous people are uh, cannot govern themselves and are seen as savages and, and reifying that. Uh, unfortunately, RBG was, uh, was part of that. And Ruth was the first person to, to really point that out to me. And so when she passed, I thought to myself, you know, we can celebrate things, but also let's, let's be um, honest in who people are and what they stood for. 
And we, we in this um, collective liberation mode uh, really need to be thinking about how uh, absent uh, voices or histories or knowledge of. And so I know something that is common, uh, commonly uh, shared in leftist communities right now is this idea of BIPOC. And usually the I is very absent. And I think it's almost disingenuous to add it until we, we really have deep relationships with our indigenous brothers, sisters, and siblings and really take seriously what Kelly has brought up, which is in the month of November, it's Native American Heritage Month. And it's also next week, we in the dominant culture think of it as Thanksgiving. And it's actually in many places a day of a morning. Um, and I've been to Plymouth, my wife is from Boston, Massachusetts, and we've been to Plymouth for those uh, protests and the National Day of Mourning to be uh, with our indigenous uh, siblings as um, they're, they're grieving the loss of, of land and of um, their, their dignity and personhood and all the things that um, we as, uh, or myself, I'll speak for myself <laughs> as a colonizer um, have, have taken away. So I wanted to start by just some storytelling, some context and why I am so incredibly uh, blessed to know Ruth and to call her a friend and a comrade and you're gonna see her spirit in a minute. I do wanna, I mean, she doesn't want me to, I'm sure, but I am gonna go down her, uh, her uh, bio, a little bit of it, because I think it's appropriate to honor her as a leader that she is in the climate justice movement. So um, here's, that was, my, that was my official intro, and now this is a, this is a bio. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Ruth is a Denian and Athabaskan, and not a Kanazi Russian Jewish woman, raised in Anchorage, Alaska. She's a member of the Kirang tribe from the Lake Iliamna region and also has roots in Bristol Bay. She's a recent graduate from Brown University, built on occupied Wampanoag and near Gennesaret land and received a BA in critical development studies with a focus on indigenous resistance and liberation. She's worked many years towards indigenous rights, advocacy and climate justice. While she started in her homelands, working with her local tribal organizations against devastating development projects her work now includes international advocacy, including attending the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, the UN Youth Climate Summit, and COP25 in Madrid, Spain. She is now the climate justice organizer for Native Movement, a matriarchal grassroots Indigenous organization, organization that fights for the rights of Indigenous peoples, their lands and waters, and justice for their ancestors and descendants. Without further ado, I'd love uh, for you all to give it up for my friend and comrade, Ruth Miller. Wow, I don't think I could ask for a more gracious and loving and pretty undeserved <laughs> introduction than that. Chikanikhali Harper, thank you. And also a big Chinan Kiriki to David for bringing us into the space with um, this beautiful language. It's always um, a joy to me to let our languages just wash over um, and attempt to reach a kind of understanding that uh, transcends just, you know, linguistics and, um, and and really listen to the meaning and the heart um, that is communicated in our ancestral languages. So uh, with that, Yachli do shivak isanch iji, deni ina kanaga shalkum kanasht u chakyanga slenish ite, shidiz naka Heather Kendall Miller, u Lloyd Miller, shunkta u shtukta, uh, Ruth Peterson, Gila, and um, Shichida Ina. I could guess in Chugu Shakaya Kilanda to Dege Kak, Shugu Yastuda, Chikane Kali Kiriki Yetel, Henel Bagut Yahli et Sete. My English name is Ruth Miller, and my Dene Ina name is Shvaik Isen, which was gifted to me by my first language teacher, Danita Slasson of Tionic Village and uh, in English means uh, whirlwind woman. Um, I uh, was born and raised in Degeikak, otherwise known as Anchorage, Alaska, but my family has roots in uh, the Lake Clark, Lake Iliamna region. We're of the Chihuang tribe now located in Dillingham in Bristol Bay, Alaska. Um, and from my father's side, I also claim and honor my Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. Um, and I am so honored to be here with all of you. I have to say, um, I, I, after I graduated college, I actually drove back to Alaska, which took two weeks. <laughs> um, but one of the most memorable days was the day that I spent 
uh, in Buffalo with Harper and Rawa. It was such such a gift uh, to be there and to see all the incredible work that you're doing. And ask Rawa, because I said maybe a billion times, God, we need this in Alaska. What you are all doing here is so inspiring to, to us and to our work. And so I'm so humbled and, and honored and um, excited and proud to, to be here with all of you. Um, and when I, when I tell my story of self and when I uh, begin to introduce myself, of course, it always has to begin with my land and with my ancestors. Um, my, I'm named after both of my grandmothers um, who are both named Ruth. Um, my then Ina grandmother was named Ruth Peterson and again came from a village a little bit north of Nan Dalton in Bristol Bay. Um, my grandmother passed away when my mother was very young her mother, my great grandmother also passed away when she was very young. And um, my mother and her sisters each carried um, intense childhood trauma that um, in many ways, you know, impeded their experience of motherhood. And so deep in my lineage, we see a fracturing of our matrilineal line um, that has so deeply echoed uh, this great love and energy that still is present in our family, um, but that is accompanied by pain, pain driven by disease, pain driven by economic hardship, um, by diaspora and dislocation. Um, and so when I view my work in climate justice, um, you'll rarely hear me label myself as an environmentalist because my advocacy for the land, for the water, for the air, that's uh, the same as my advocacy for the people I love for the beings that I love, my advocacy for myself, um, the way that I show up as an authentic descendant is also the way that I show up as a committed future ancestor. Um, and so being raised here in Alaska on Denina homelands, even though um, I didn't grow up in the village, I grew up in what we call the big village. <laughs> um, our connection to spirit and to place is integral because when I walk through, you know, these lands, what might now be the largest city in uh, Alaska, which is still very small, um, I'm still walking on land that my ancestors walked on. I'm still naming our moose Denengi and our bears Khaha um, and recognizing them in the language that they taught us uh, millennia ago. Um, and so to think about, you know, my entrance to like how I got into this work, it's very difficult, I think, as a Native person, because um, again, it's, it's uh, self-affirming work. It's, it's life-affirming work to stand up for um, our rights as communities, as people, um, as relatives. Um, but I can't ever stop myself from telling the story of my first job. I went to work when I was 15. Um, out in Bristol Bay in a town called Dillingham, um, where my grandmother partially grew up um, and where our ancestors are from. I worked for United Tribes of Bristol Bay, um, who's, uh, who represent 13 of our regional tribes, including my own, predominantly against uh, the development of Pebble Mine, which is an extraordinarily toxic and destructive proposed mining project um, in the last great salmon fishery in the world and in the headwaters of the Bristol Bay watershed, which would be devastating to the perpetual subsistence lifestyle of our peoples um, and the cultural and, and spiritual um, existence of our, of our communities. Um, and so I, you know, flew up or flew over was, you know, put up with a family. And uh, at 15, I didn't quite know what I was doing. Um, and so I was a little bit nervous when I had to call my boss and tell her that I was going to miss the first day of work. And she asked why. I told her, the fish hit the net. And she said, oh, you won't come in for a couple of days. That's fine. Have a good time. The fish hit the net. The salmon, the king salmon had come into our set nets and it was time to go pick them. That was doing the work, helping the family that I was there with to cut, process, smoke, dry, or fish um, was the most integral introduction that I could have had to climate justice work. Um, because synonymous with um, the advocacy and 
the policy and litigation that we pursue on behalf of our land defense, we must also remember why these uh, rights, why these relationships are so precious to us and our existence as people who live with and love the land. Um, a summer after that, I was not at fish camp, elbow deep in guts and blood. I was running through the US Senate in Washington DC as um, the youngest ever intern uh, in the US Senate for former Senator Mark Begich. Um, and although I know how to cut an ulu real, cut with an ulu real good, um, I also had to learn how to run in heels <laughs> and how to speak with very big words. <laughs> and to me, this experience um, really broadened my uh, depth of understanding for what it means to walk between two worlds. Um, my parents, again, as I always honor them, um, I, I, I learned so much in our traditional way by watching, by observing. Um, partially because that's our way and partially because they were busy as hell <laughs> as two Native American rights lawyers. Um, but my mother, who never graduated high school, who ran away at 16, got married at 17, had a kid at 21, my sister, and eventually made it to law school. And my father, who grew up in Lower East Side, Manhattan, um, and went to a prep school <laughs> and, um, and, and had a very different pathway. Both came to the same uh, human rights, uh, land-based advocacy work, and often work together. Um, and although that mixed race and um, very, you know, highly contrasting cultural experience, um, I think did give me uh, quite a bit of angst as a young person, I also began to see uh, my role as a bridge, um, one that would be able to navigate both of these spaces and use both my privilege and my life experience um, and the wealth of all of my cultures uh, to bring people together to advocate for what's right. Um, and so, uh, you know, eventually I found myself in college and uh, began, I think, broadening my understanding of um, what it means to be Indigenous and what it means to be an Indigenous ally, not only to other um, communities of color, but to other Indigenous communities as well. Um, as president and a an primary organizer for um, Native American student groups, um, I began to really um, dive into what it means to have trans-Indigenous power building and movement building. Um, this brought me to a huge, um, hugely impactful, you know, wealth of loving relationships with diverse indigenous communities all over the place, whether it was through my study abroad or there on Wampanoag and Narragansett occupied lands. Um, I realized that we have so much uh, power and potential and wisdom amongst our indigenous communities uh, worldwide, but particularly here in uh, what some call Turtle Island. Um, and that began reframing my experience with um, knowledge in academia. You know, I had, was familiar with knowledge of um, being out in the Bay, um, knowledge of, of how to work with our land, how to work with our fish, how to translate that um, subsistence lifestyle, that, um, you know, subsistence and economic dependency on the land into policy. And I understood knowledge that was written into law um, and to legal frameworks, whether it was through my political work in the Senate or through my experience with my parents. But this um, opened my mind so much more broadly uh, to a kind of epistemology, a kind of knowledge that um, could be fundamentally anti-colonial um, by using the potential, the experience, the love, the culture, the strength and the joy of our diverse indigenous communities to answer our own social needs, our own historical and generational healing um, and, our, and to create, to write our own futurisms. Um, and so through a lot of my work at school, I began um, writing and, and developing work on what trans indigenous futures could use and, and could, could be. And that um, I think has really brought me to um, not only um, travel uh, in, 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 and learning, you know, tender um, learning from 
our brothers and sisters worldwide, but it also um, encouraged my advocacy through avenues like the United Nations um, and other national and international advocacy groups and decision making spaces, um, which, of course, had very, very little indigenous representation and very, very, very little Arctic representation. Um, and so as my kind of scale shifted from working on important local projects that have global impacts um, to global projects <laughs> that have local impacts, um, I, I began to find myself um, kind of walking in spaces where um, not many others looked like me, not many others came from places like me. Um, and I think then was when my work turned towards um, turn towards opening those avenues for, for discussion, collaboration, um, not just, you know, pulling up more seats to the table, but building our own damn tables <laughs> and writing our own menus. Um, and so um, I've been really, really honored to have you know, or to maybe kind of shove my foot in the door in a lot of different um, spaces, including most recently um, the Global Climate Accords, uh, where I was able to travel with the first all indigenous youth delegation uh, from the US um, and represent my people there. Um, but um, so much of so much of all of that work I found is really, you know, it, it's it's storytelling work. It's just conveying our histories, our knowledges, our experiences um, in compelling ways and saying insistently and loudly and proudly that, that we matter, that our lives matter, that our well-being matters. Um, and so as I um, you know, began contributing more and more here um, locally and globally on, um, in, into these dialogues and conversations, it was very much a concern for me that my voice not be the only representative voice from Alaska or the Arctic either. So we began a project called Always Indigenous Media, uh, which serves to be almost a news source or a media branch of our um, people powered movement here in Alaska that aims to create pathways to engagement for um, particularly our rural community members so that their voices uh, can be heard in these dialogue spaces. Um, and so that these dialogue spaces will have increasing accountability to the communities that they claim to represent. So while this started statewide, I'm really proud of the fact that I was able to bring this media program to the Global Climate Accords and all using social, a social pretty extensive social media strategy, we were able to um, not only conduct interviews with a huge array of global leaders, but I was able to, you know, pop up on Instagram for always indigenous media and say, this is the situation where debating article six, I'm about to go into a meeting with the United States State Department. What would you like me to ask? And I was able to be accountable to my community and to um, our community members in that way. And so we're really reaching for more and more opportunities to, um, force these colonial spaces open. Um, we do the same work with local and state elections and nationally I've been working a lot through um, the frontline table and the Green New Deal, making sure that we are well protected and well represented. Um, but, you know, I, I really kind of tire from um, listing listing all this and you know I, I could go on I'm sure um you know there there are lots of other there are always lots of other moving pieces in this work um but instead I think the piece that I would like to share most about lastly um is the fact that you know as a young native woman um you know to be to be honest I'm exhausted <laughs> um and I began being exhausted years and years and years ago. Um, I know personally that particularly um, as an empath and as a highly spiritual person, um, I struggled very much entering this advocacy work and not um, being able to protect myself 
from not only taking on burdens that weren't mine, but committing my energy and my life force um, in places that um, that were only uh, able to, to drain that from me and not give back. And so um, very young through college, I um, for sure began, you know, experiencing depression and anxiety, but also began a very intense conversation um, with myself about what it means to be uh, sustainable in advocacy work, um, what burnout actually looks like and feels like, but also what will I do when as a young native woman, this will be the rest of my life. Um, and you know, I kind of used to make the joke that I could like time my depression back to the day, it was a Tuesday, I remember, that I decided to organize travel for 11 of us native students to go stand with the Acheti Shekoan at Standing Rock. Um, and so much of my uh, mental health and my emotional health was um, deeply intertwined with the advocacy work um, that I, I absolutely burned out. And I actually began having um, very serious chronic health problems uh, because of the way I was unable to manage my stress. Um, and so, you know, looking back, I can say that um, it was important growth. Um, I received my traditional tattoos, which um, were a very important piece of that. And I've turned inward, but it also forced me to develop um, not only theory, but practice around how I want to be a warrior. And to me, the answer that came to me, um, something that I offered um, as our graduation speaker um, two years ago was uh, radical compassion, um, not just for our causes, but for ourselves in this work. Um, something that a professor told me as I was telling her I had to drop her class <laughs> was that, you know, Ruth, you have to figure out how to take care of yourself because in 40 years, someone else will be doing something terrible and you're gonna have to fight it as much then as you would fight it now. And that kind of sucks, <laughs> but it's also a hard truth to learn. Um, and so I feel that, you know, throughout all of this crazy advocacy work and running around the world and doing all these different things, the most important and most compelling and most life-changing work that I invest myself in by choice is the work of wellness and healing, uh, not just for myself, but for my community. Um, as a commitment to my descendants, I have the responsibility of healing the generational trauma that moves within my spirit and body um, so that it doesn't poison my descendants. Um, but also my commitment to my community is to build things that are not only um, new, and radical and decolonial, but that are built with love, that are built with care, that are built in a good way um, so that their foundations will be strong, stable and compassionate um, because what we're building now will be built to last. Um, so I, I guess, you know, I, I'm really excited to hear from all of you. I'm excited to hear about your experiences um, and what you bring into this work. But, you know, if anything, I think that that's the message that I would like to leave on that joy is radical and that healing is everyone's first duty. Um, a very important teacher taught me that um, our body is our first territory that we must defend. Um, and that has been a healing practice of my own to think about. I mean, I know that the health and well being of our women in particular, our Native women, is one and the same as the health and well being of our lands and waters. Um, we see that with our disappearances and murders of women, we see that mm -hmm. toxins and pollutants in our communities, in our bodies, um, but we also see that in our spirits. And so as we pour our love into these lands that we work so hard to defend. Um, as we pour our love into these people that we're fighting for, we have to remember to reserve that love for ourselves, to invest in reciprocal structures um, that make this work fundamentally joyful. Um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm really proud to be here. I'm happy to be here with all of you. 
it um it really lifts my heart up to to see Harper's face in particular um, and I'm excited to speak more with all of you I'm excited for some questions Chickenick Chinen thank you thank you Ruth uh, so with that, we are going to open up the floor for questions, beginning our Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to just unmute yourself um, and ask your question, or you can type it in the chat and I can read it, whatever your preference is. I have so many questions, but I'm going to let others jump in if they're not going to. I have a list here, so... All right, yeah, Harper, if you want to go ahead and ask your first question. Yeah, great. So um, there's so many things. First of all, Ruth, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, that just already lifted my spirits and I appreciate your uh, truth telling and honesty. I think we all need it to just say this work is tiring and we are exhausted, especially as people who are in marginalized communities or in folks who hold certain positions that have to continue to knock open the doors or be the only person at the table or create the table, all those things. So just uh, appreciate you just telling the truth. I think that we're, we're all hungry for it. Um, there's a few things uh, that I wanted to talk about, which is, um, you know, you touch on it uh, about, you know, the missing and murdered women and uh, what that has been like, and especially as you're uh, organization proclaims to be a matriarchal organization, and I know that you've taken a lot of activism. And can you update us on that situation in Alaska, what folks are doing, and just, um, I don't think that a lot of people even understand the disappearance of indigenous women and how it's impacting communities, especially the lineage that you all derive from and looking to matriarchal lineages. Can you just speak to that a little bit more? Because I know you touched on it, but I would love to hear more about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, for those who um, are unaware or who, who have yet to be exposed to the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two-spirit siblings, um, the number one thing I can say is, is educate yourself um, because our sisters, our mothers, our aunties, our daughters are being stolen from us at disproportionate rates more than any other demographic in the United States our native women are being harmed. We see that in direct correlation to um, not only um, obviously structurally racist policing systems, but also in extreme proximity to development projects. Um, throughout the Midwest and particularly Canada, uh, we see the practice of man camps being used um, as labor forces wherein um, development projects who do not want to invest in funding uh, for training of local laborers will often fly in um, outside laborers, obviously predominantly men, um, from oil-based um, economy states uh, like Texas and Tennessee and others, um, or from other regions of Canada, um, to create bunker systems of um, of men, like man camps, and we see a huge amount of violence uh, directly surrounding these encampments um, where there is uh, next to no um, police accountability, next to no community accountability. In our uh, Alaska setting, particularly because we have um, such so many rural communities, there are often only uh, volunteer, they're called VPSOs or VSOs, uh, volunteer public safety officers um, who might, might work with a state trooper if there's a single state trooper in the area, um, or they might um, have to call into the nearest regional hub, which could be uh, days away by plane or by boat, uh, considering weather conditions. Um, so there's no guarantee of safety for our women statewide, and certainly not in urban settings either, where we have um, extremely poorly allocated police resources, um, and next to no uh, legal follow-up uh, for the prosecution of perpetrators of violence against our women. Um, luckily in Alaska, um, we have strong native women who are stepping up to this work. Um, native movement is a leader uh, in advocacy for missing and murdered indigenous women um, 
And I'm so constantly proud to work with the incredible matriarchs that I do who have um, begun dialogues, not just with local and state officials, but also with the police department, uh, talking about public safety programming um, and trainings that can help protect our women um, and see an increase in um, accountability uh, for policing uh, forces. But additionally, um, we have begun doing men's wellness trainings and circles, um, which invest in how uh, violence harms our men as well. Uh, we know that though the perpetrators of violence are predominantly men, um, hurt people hurt people. And what our community struggles with is not just the advent of violence, um, but uh, extraordinary experiences of generational trauma and harm, um, exclusion from forms of uh, culture and community that used to make us strong. Uh, we have uh, we have been so uh, exploited by the state and federal government. Um, it's difficult to blame our own community members for the extraordinarily high rates of mental health and substance abuse that we see in our rural communities. So part of solving missing and murdered indigenous women is not just uh, an issue within our justice system, it's a social problem as well. It's a healing um, initiative as well to not just help our men understand um, and return to our indigenous forms of masculinity um, and away from forms of toxic masculinity that encourage violence against women, um, but to also help all of our community members understand commitment to community, understand what safety and security and anti-violence looks like in an indigenous community setting, um, and to work with our partners and allies to increase awareness um, and to turn funding towards this issue. A huge part of this issue is also um, the politics of data. Um, there are so many cases that are unaccounted for um, and we have, uh, especially uh, some of my colleagues have had a very heavy hand in creating some of the first databases uh, for recording uh, crimes against our women. Um, but it's, it's a very heavy um, issue here in Alaska. Um, to be honest, I don't know a single woman, I don't know a single native woman that has not faced violence. Um, and I don't know a single Native woman who hasn't lost someone they love to violence, to gendered violence specifically. Um, so the work, the work continues. Um, you know, we do it with all the love in our hearts. And, um, and there are always ways to support this work. So like I said at the beginning, there are many ways to educate yourself. Um, and this, is, this is collective healing work. It's time. All right, and before we let Harper ask any more questions, if anybody else, does anybody else have any questions that they want to ask in this moment? Because if not, I'll ask the question. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'll ask my question then. Uh, so I recently watched the Chicago 7 for the first time. It's a movie that um, talks about, you know, the Chicago riots and the organizers involved in that. And so um, I think one of the things that really came across to me as an organizer was the distinct way that they represented the different personalities of the organizers and kind of how they do their work. Um, so as like an advocate, is there a specific trait or way you do your work that you think really makes you stand out amongst other people? Whoa, that's a really hard question. <laughs> um... I, th I think I would have to sit on that for a little. You know, I think that there are qualities that we as a team really um, thrive in and value. And part of that's humor. Um, like on our Slack channel, we have a lot of conversations about astrology. You know, I mean, it's, it's making um, our advocacy work an investment in one another and in our relationships just as much as it is in whatever project uh, we're working on. Um, as an individual, I I don't know. I think I would be interested to ask that of my peers and see what they they think I, <laughs> I bring. <laughs> um, but um, I I think maybe what I can answer is what I aspire to bring. 
Um, and I think what I really um, aspire to bring into this work is that um, awareness and and care for healing and well being. Um, I don't think we are doing the right work if the work is at our own personal expense um, or we're not doing the work in a good way. Um, and that's been a difficult lesson for me because I am a total workaholic <laughs> and I run myself into the ground all the time. Um, but fortunately for me, at least I have a very um, communicative body and spirit um, and when I am not tending my own fire, my body lets me know. Um, and I mean, coming back to our um, work with missing and murdered indigenous women, um, there was a time when I was not tending to my spirit and to the needs of my own capacity that I began to notice um, whenever I would do MMIWG work, um, whether it was a conference call or anything, um, I'd get off the phone and within seconds, um, I would feel my chronic pain flare up. Um, I would feel a physical response to the emotional weight of the work I was doing. Um, and that wasn't sustainable. Um, and it wasn't healing for me as a native woman who has suffered trauma to be re-traumatizing herself in an attempt to advocate. Um, so I realized that I needed to do my personal spiritual work. I needed to do my healing work um, to sit down with myself, to think through, all right, body, what are you trying to tell me? What's going on? I need to take the time with my own spirit so that when I do this work, I can do it from a place of, of strength um, and authenticity. Um, so I hope that's a perspective that I can, can bring. <laughs> That's a oh, good question. Thank you. That, that was perfect. I always ask uh, more intense questions, as I'm sure the <laughs> or team will <laughs> acknowledge. Um, but if no one else has any questions, I can pass it back to Harper. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to keep going. Um, so <laughs> I don't know how much time we have, Kelly. So you flagged me when I should, because I have two questions. Um, uh, pick your favorite of the two questions. Okay. All right. All right. So, yeah. So I guess I'll land us in the place where, um, you know, just as you talked about trans indigenous um, relationships and how important they are, I think I want to bring us back to the fact that we're in trans local partnership. And so we obviously joined together with the communities that I've mentioned before, Kentucky, Richmond, California, uh, and Alaska. And there's some things that you told us were small interventions that we could take back home and then educate others on. If we were to continue to obviously want to spread what you've discussed and shared with us tonight, what are some of the key takeaways that you would want to bottom line to say, how can we be in solidarity with uh, the work that you're doing and with the indigenous peoples of Alaska? Mm, Shana, for that question. Well, I think that um, the first responsibility that I would name is to the indigenous community of Buffalo, um, uh, thinking constantly and consistently um, and continually about how you are showing up as a guest on indigenous lands um, and what your ongoing commitment is to the protection and preservation of those lands, but also to the true leadership and power shift to um, the indigenous peoples of those lands. Um, because, you know, we, we have a lot of folks who fall in love with Alaska and, um, you know, want to, want to provide help and support here. Um, but we have also learned um, guided by our indigenous wisdom and through the incredible wisdom of Adrienne Marie Brown, that small is all and that place-based leadership um, investing in, in traditional ecological knowledge of a place is the um, most powerful way to show your love for that place. So um, to be in relationship with, with our causes um, as Alaska Native relatives up here in the North, we also ask that you be in good relationship with indigenous relatives in your region um, and grow from there. Um, 
for us, you know, so many of our issues are have global impacts. We up here in the north, I mean, I'm yeah, I guess I haven't really talked about it much, but my primary work is as a climate justice organizer. And um, due to the phenomena of Arctic amplification, we here in the North experience climate change at three to four times the rate as the rest of the world. Um, we also have, um, a, you know, horrendously underrepresented communities um, and extremely vulnerable frontline communities here living um, on the land and for the land without infrastructure, um, often without education, without fiber optic cable, uh, without healthcare resources. Um, but instead of a story of victimization of how vulnerable Alaska is, I would ask you as our allies to um, also begin telling the story of how though we are um, on the front lines of climate change, we also um, have the frontline solutions. And it is the return to our indigenous knowledge base, to our re relationship with land and to our strong cultures that provide guidance to global climate solutions. Um, because fundamentally, we're not just looking at policy, we're looking at the values that drive policy and that inform policy. And so as we reform our global economic system and as we reform our you know, US empire political system, we also have to consider what are the underlying values that we consent to. Um, and at the moment, the underlying values of, of the US government are predominantly white supremacist. And I think I dropped in the uh, chat a very important TED talk uh, by Mark Charles, which we offer in uh, some of our decolonization trainings that I really recommend you check out. Um, but, you know, change, change the story that's, that you hear about native peoples in Alaska and in America, you know, begin telling the story of, of our strength and our leadership and our solutions, um, because we're here doing the work for our people and for our lands. Um, you know, there are a million ways to get involved with our issues. There are a hundred calls to action for land defense projects in the state um, that we really recommend you check out. Feel free to check out our website if you'd like to learn more about uh, what volunteering at distance could look like. Um, or what actions are, are being called because so many of our land defense campaigns um, are, are national conversations um, and set national precedent. Um, so particularly in the protection of the um, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in the North and the Tongass National Forest in the Southeast, um, these are issues that are facing Congress right now. So everyone has a role to play um, and we really thank you for your solidarity. Oh, oh, Linda, did you have something to say real quick? Yes, um, just just to ask a minute, because what strikes me is you talk about the people in the land and the story. And we live in a culture where people never consider the land as a part of them. And um, which I think is a huge trauma for most, most of, of us, an unknown one, because we don't realize how being separate from the land um, actually is cutting ourselves off from sources of love and power. And um, I'm sorry, I missed the first part about what you talked about, but I did hear you just speak about the land and the body and the relationship of, of that wholeness and wondered if you could just say a few more thoughts about um, the way in which you watch us, you know how we're trying to work and organizing around justice and issues is how land can be brought into that conversation more than what we've been able to do. Well, I don't, thank you, Linda Chickenick. Um, and I don't know that, you know, it's it's my place to to provide critique of the incredible work of, of Push Buffalo and your partners. I, I think I said at the beginning, um, before you joined us that, you know, when I was able to visit um, Buffalo with, with Harper and Rawa, I mean, Rawa drove me around in her car for about four hours with her baby. And I just said maybe a million times, I wish we had this in Alaska. Um, so, I mean, when it comes to integrating relationship with land, you know, as I've said, um, that has to begin with learning from and learning with those who have had an ancestral relationship with that land um, for eons. I, I guess maybe the way that I would like to describe it is um, when, we, when we meet someone, 
um, we get to know them, we show them our respect, we come to learn them and over time, um, we come close, we, we become uh, integrated into one another, we become connected. Um, the time of our earth is so much longer than our conception of time. And so when we think of learning a place, we have to consider that you might not learn a place to the same degree in one lifetime that someone has learned a place over thousands and thousands of generations. And that is fundamentally the difference that describes the relationship between indigenous peoples and their land. When I am on my pl place, when I'm here on my land, I know that I carry not just my knowledge as a young woman named Ruth, I carry thousands and thousands and thousands of years of my ancestors walking barefoot on this dirt and drinking this water and eating these berries and speaking with our Denegi and our Shika and our Kaga and our Kajna. And that knowledge is fundamentally um, unique to my lineage and to this place. And those that, and, and when I travel, I am very attentive to introduce myself to places that I go and to be in good relationship, to work towards good relationship with the indigenous people of that place. When I find myself on new lands, I make an offering. I show my respect to those lands because I don't know them yet but I'm very eager to learn them. And I'm eager to learn from those that have had, those that have had thousands and thousands of years of relationship with that place. But I know that my experience in one lifetime will never match that. But I also know that I can begin my relationship with that place so that my descendants might become closer. So when I think of, um, you know, we work with many non-native allies here, of course, and, and we're grateful for them and they have a deep and integral role um, in our community here in Alaska. But what does it mean to be a respectful guest? It means knowing that you are a guest and that although you will grow to love this beautiful place with all of your heart, ask me in a thousand years if we understand this place the same way and maybe then we will say yes. But until then, we will understand this place in a beautifully different way. And so being in relationship with land and integrating land into your work means not only showing that respect that you might with someone that you're meeting and getting to know and learning about, but it also means showing um, that you prioritize indigenous stewardship of those lands because our indigenous communities have the greatest knowledge and the greatest willingness to share our knowledge of land with others. All right, Ruth, thank you so much um, for being here today and answering these questions. It was just such a great opportunity to have you here and I'm so glad that we were able to get you and um, you were willing to make time. So I definitely appreciate it. Um, everybody, we're gonna be moving into a quick five minute break. Um, and then we are going to regroup and do our breakout sessions. So go get yourself a snack.